Okay guys, uh, hello and welcome back to this special edition on the Fly project and as it is denoted in here, diesel storage problems and diesel engines in general and why it's a bad choice for preppers. Okay, now before I start this video I'd just like to say this is not a knock on the person who uh, I'm going to talk about. It's only just making references but I watched a video by them the other day, this Canadian prepper, and I found that um, possibly because diesel engine is less common in the Canada, Canadian area and the uh, United States is that they probably don't see the problems that we have and they probably haven't had the experiences that we have. So it's not a reflection on his character or his knowledge because I know I watch the guy and I learn a lot about preparedness and the psychology uh, behind uh, possible uh, shit hits the fan situations. So this is not a knock. What I'm trying to do is fill in the gaps which he's left out, which is I find very, very important that people should know about, okay? Now, uh, he talks about fuel storage and uh, the fact that the diesel engine is the uh, preferred choice for uh, preppers, yeah? Now, I would disagree with that straight away. A, through uh, experience of diesel engines, diesel fuel problems and the systems related to it because of my uh, professional ties to the uh, haulage industry, but also experiences in the Ukraine. Okay, or Ukraine, however you like to say. If you want to correct me on that, I don't mind. But I call it the Ukraine yeah, article, yeah? So, um, basically, I think uh, diesel engines are not the best option for a prepper unless they are going to use heavyweight vehicles where you need to pull weight about with you, okay? Now, I'm, I'm talking like truck size, 7.5 tonne, 3.5 to 7.5 tonne, 18 tonne or 44 tonne if you like, okay? because that fuel uh, lends itself to giving uh, good power or good torque at low revs. If you notice, the diesel engine uh, doesn't rev very hard. Little diesel engines do, however. Okay, little engines can do. Uh, but they are <laughs> they are um, they are a different thing altogether compared to the bigger trucks. Okay, the gearing is designed for pulling weight. The rev range for the vehicles is designed for pulling weight. But these vehicles do have problems with fuel. They do have problems. The storage of fuel, the supply of fuel, and the use of fuel all have their issues. And with modern technology or sophisticated diesel engines, as they they are known these days, are actually more sensitive than they ever have been. Yeah, so this is a point to remember, okay? But I will talk you through this. It's going to be a long one, and I think I better do it in two parts. So I will talk about gasoline and um, uh, gas and stuff like that in the second part of this video. If you're interested, you can click through and watch. But it's important that you know the differences, um, okay, with, with diesel engines. Right, so... Um, let's start at the beginning. Diesel engine is compression ignition, yeah? So you atomize... Um, diesel and by compression of the friction of the air being compressed into a very tight space it makes the fuel explode okay and that's where you get your chemical to mechanical transfer so it pushes the piston down okay now within that system you need a low pressure pump to get the fuel from the tank or a transfer pump um, you then need a high pressure pump to pressurize the fuel to a decent pressure to be able to crack off the injectors. Now, common rail diesels and the older diesels with inline and rotary pumps are different. They're different. They, they are a completely different breed, okay? And um, one of those, the common rail, is uh, much more sensitive than the older type, but they still are sensitive to water and diesel, okay, and contaminated fuels. So, um, when you start with the diesel and you are going to store fuel, okay, you've got to be aware that you can get something called diesel eye, okay, which is a fungus which grows in the water, which is in, uh, maybe in a storage tank, and that will screw the fuel up, okay. Water in itself in a diesel system is not very good news, and every vehicle either has uh, some sort of uh, water trap, and a warning system or they will have a water trap that you need to check regularly so 
Older diesels, rotary pumps, some of you Land Rover guys will know this, you have a sedimenter at the back end of the vehicle near the tank which separates the water from the fuel because the fuel uh, raises, it floats on, on water and then that's free to go onto the filter to be filtered. Okay. Later diesel engines, they expect a higher quality of fuel, therefore they will have a, an indicator, usually a high, hydrometer, something like that, in the filter, at the bottom of the filter, which will sense when there is water present in that fuel and it will let you know on the dashboard of the vehicle. Okay, that is when you need to take immediate action and drain. Generally, you want to be draining your fuel filter housing at least once a week to remove the water out of the diesel fuel. Now, the, there are two problems with this. I've already told you about the um, biological part of it and the fact that it can be infected and it takes a very short time for that fungus to grow, Okay, which is a black mold, if you like. Um, it will grow either in storage tanks or it will grow in vehicle tanks. Okay, Once you've got it, it's really hard to get rid of. It's really hard to get rid of. Okay, the water side of it, um, if you happen to be injecting water with your fuel, what will happen, it will cool down the injector tips because they're very fine needles that, that move very, very quickly, okay? That will cool them down sufficiently enough for them to shatter, okay, or break the ends off. There, the um, injector will fail. It won't atomize the fuel, therefore you'll get dribbling from the injector, which can cause a mechanical failure by um washing the bores yeah once it's washed the oil out of it the the uh, the friction increases and that can damage the engine so there you go the other thing is particulate uh, contaminants okay that is a uh, little bits of solid which with a diesel engine compared to a, a petrol engine the filter s filtration system is actually quite large to be able to cope with that now poor fuel engines will run on poor fuel okay and uh the common rail diesel will probably break down it doesn't like bad fuel at all whereas the older pumps with inline injection systems or rotary uh, injection systems that's things like bosch ve pumps um they manage with it they manage with it okay but there is a limit you can get to Usually what happens with a diesel engine, if it's got a lot of contaminants in it, it won't run. It will block the filters up or it will block um, restrictions in the filtering system before it gets to the pump. But the system is a lot bigger. Anybody who knows uh, diesel and petrol engines, you will see there is a difference in, in filtering systems. Okay, So that is a very, very important point that you should remember if you happen to go down the route of being a prepper in a shit hits the fan situation and you're choosing a vehicle to be able to cope with that situation. Modern diesels, as far as I'm concerned, they are very sophisticated. In fact, they're too complex to be able to um, survive for a long period of time where you're issued with bad fuel yeah, or water contaminated fuel. In fact, um, I can't mention the haulage companies that, that we know. They have problems with the fuel uh, that they get from supermarkets because the bunding tanks that they have some of them are old some of them have got contaminants in them and they've caused problems yeah haulage companies lorries uh, use a lot more fuel they draw a lot more through the tank and through the system and there are systems in place now you get a large pre-filter yeah which deals with most of those contaminants which stops the breakdowns but it's, it's an ongoing issue um, with supermarkets and I'm not mentioning any names. It's, it's not my business to say okay now It's not just supermarket fuels. It's not just supermarket fuels, but they are the main culprit because they sell the most fuel don't they? Yeah, so we've covered that aspect of it haven't we? Yeah um, The other thing with diesel engines they're not as versatile as you think they are I know that people can use gas over diesel. That is just to get the efficiency of the burn. However, Common Rail, they have uh, computerized settings to be able to do pre and post injection burns to uh, burn the fuel more completely. Whereas gas will do it on an older vehicle. Yeah, it just helps give you a little bit more MPG. Some people might even know that you can use Brown's gas to, to give you a better burn. Yeah, uh, that's hydrogen, by the way. Yeah. Um, the other thing is using veg oils and using biodiesel. Now, biodiesel is very aggressive, very aggressive fuel. It will, in fact, cause seal failures in injection pumps if you have the wrong type of diesel engine. 
injection system. Yes, that's a fact, okay? It's not very popular, as you as you know. It's not being sold in very many places, and anybody who's making their own biodiesel is actually very, very energy intensive to do. Using straight veg oil, or vegetable oil, they call it SVO in, in the UK, and that has its own issues because veg oil itself is very sensitive to weather conditions. Uh, it will either clog up and wax a lot earlier than what diesel will, um, but the viscosity is actually wrong for injecting it into a diesel engine, so you can't do it. You, you can't do it just straight off the bat, run off vegetable oil. What you need to do is to warm it to a consistency where it has the same viscosity as diesel fuel. And then once you've got it to that viscosity, you can inject it. But afterwards, you need to purge the whole of the fuel system by switching it back onto diesel, to run it onto diesel, to flush it out and then you're ready to start again in the morning otherwise everything gums up because vegetable oil that is just the the nature of it it also causes problems with lubrication in the engine it causes gumming up of piston rings which means that the oil control and the compression rings do not work properly so in itself it's not a good fuel yes i know people put vegetable oil in their tanks and we do have 5% of vegetable oil mixed in with our diesel fuel to bring uh, us up to some sort of European standard, yeah? But that's as far as you can go. If you're lugging a load of uh, uh, chip fat into your fuel system, you are looking for problems straight away. It also, the injection pump, you will know this because if you use it for a period of time with high percentage of vegetable oil mixed with your diesel, it will fail. That's just as simple as that, okay? And I've seen a lot of failures over my life, okay? Now, I did actually use the SVO for a while, and that was all good until China had a problem with um, a famine or something like that. Their crops failed, and they ended up buying a lot of uh, soy oil and carting it to China. And what happened overnight, the price went um, from something like 98 pence a litre, which was cheaper than the diesel, right up to 154 pence. At that point, I stopped because it was cheaper to run on diesel than it was to run on veg oil. So it's one of those sort of things that will come in short supply. The last thing is scavenging uh, vegetable oils from chip shops. Yes, people do it, they do process it, and they have a success. And they may not be running as much fuel through their uh, fuel systems as what trucks will. Now, McDonald's, they claim to be using uh, vegetable oil or recycled vegetable oil in their trucks. And I can imagine their uh, maintenance bills are very expensive. I don't know, I don't work on that fleet, so I, I really can't say. However, talking to a guy I know who was... Uh, getting recycled oil um, he showed me a container of it. he says you do not want to use this stuff because oil is hydroscopic it absorbs moisture it absorb absorbs the food oils and it's a devil to get out there are still a lot of water molecules and particulates floating about in that veg oil which is very hard to remove okay now um i will say though i will say this um with biodiesel there is a small window of vehicles, uh, that, should I say window, there is a window of opportunity for certain vehicles to run on veg oil. Okay, now, um, Lucas Systems, which is a rotary pump, they are not good at all because the seals uh, in them, they do not like uh, any type of uh, contaminant, could I say. They don't like anything else other than the diesel fuel that they were made for, okay, whereas the Bosch VE pump, is a lot more forgiving therefore people with land rovers 300 tdi engines and i'm pretty sure that there are vehicles in america volkswagen for instance and i think some of the dodges have got these bosch ve pumps they are a lot more tolerant for alternative fuels okay so it's a possibility i think personally unless you have a bigger vehicle um the diesel fuel is not the best choice you also have uh, restrictions on fuel, and you can imagine if you have a, a shit hits the fan situation, you have the majority in this country, in the UK, the majority of vehicles are all, all commercial vehicles, emergency vehicles, they all run on diesel fuel. They are the ones that will get priority if there's a fuel shortage. If you're storing fuel, or uh, prepping fuel, <laughs> whichever way you, you want to do it, you'll be considered as a hoarder maybe. 
Um, if they know about the fact you have fuel storages, they will come and take it off you before their needs. This is what I think, because everything runs on it. Whereas gasoline, on the other hand, and gas, they're not likely to look at that at all, are they? Generators, on the other hand, that's a different matter, isn't it? You will have storage for your generators to run them on, and I'm pretty sure you'll have chainsaws that run on petrol. Now, with regards to storing and keeping fuel, I do not want to talk about this because it's not my speciality, whereas the Canadian prepper knows a lot more about that, and this is where his views are valid. But as I've said in this video, it's very important that you understand that the fuel systems are not tolerant at all. So I've told you about it now. You can do more research on it. There's The internet is there and uh, there are specialists that will tell you exactly what to do if you want to run on veg oil. There are specialists there will tell you how to get rid of uh, infections in your diesel uh, storage systems. Yeah. Other than that, we can't go any further with that. The common rail now, as it is, is a pain in the backside. Say, for instance, you are um, in a shit hits the fan situation where you have fuel that's okay, then you're fine. Yeah, a drop in quality of fuel will obviously upset the engine because it doesn't doesn't like low quality fuel. Now, the other side of it, of course, if you get good quality fuel, however, you can't get maintenance done properly, and it's over a long period of time. There's always the opportunity of deleting the EGR valve from electronic vehicles at the ECU. You can also delete um, some of the um, uh, DPF instrumentation out of it. And this is basically, you have to find somebody who could trick the ECU into getting readings that they're looking for on the exhaust system. Because if you're running for any period of time and your DPF gets blocked up, for instance, and you can't get the parts that are in trouble, you have to find another way around it. Now, when I was in the Ukraine, this was, what, 10 years ago, there were small little kiosks around with specialist guys who could tap into ECUs and do all sorts of magic, yeah? And these people will appear if needs be. I'm damn sure of that. There are guys that are on the internet that will do stuff like that for you, but it's illegal to uh, mess with your emission systems as it is. But it's always worth, if you're going down the route of getting a diesel engine, is to find out exactly what people are where, just in case you need that sort of thing done, okay? All right then, guys, hello to the second part. As you'll notice, these are unlisted videos because I really only want to share it with people who are interested in, in prepping rather than the whole world, okay? Let them find out for themselves, okay? If they watch my fly videos, they'll know that I'll start to introduce these unlisted videos a little bit more so they're not on view to the whole world. Now, in Canadian Prepper's video, uh, he was talking about the fact that in his area, there's something like 90% of or 90 odd percent of uh, gasoline vehicles and the other small percent is diesel powered vehicles. Now in the UK, it's quite the reverse. We have more diesel cars on the road because it's economical than we do gasoline. Diesel and fuel, uh, diesel fuel and uh, gasoline all have their jobs and they all have their place mainly it is used for commercial vehicles okay but people have town cars which run on diesel and they think it's economical and to a point it is yes you get good mileage on diesel fuel the the uh, calorific value is better if you like you get better power at low torque but smaller cars are not geared right for um, pulling heavy loads compared to like say a seven and a half tonner or a 300, uh, three hundred three uh three thousand five hundred kilogram van okay they're geared for weight pulling okay it's the same with the with a land rover they're geared just right aren't they yeah uh, but people are under the illusion that these vehicles are um fairly good they're maintenance free until they get a problem okay and it's mainly because of dpfs now DPFs block up very quickly when people are running short distances. The exhausts need to get hot to be able to burn the soot off, okay? If they don't, then it either needs a regeneration and the car will start to do that if the vehicle goes on a long journey, or it needs to be done with a guy like myself, which is um, doing a forced regeneration to clear that out. 
Now, uh, in a shit hits the fan situation, you'll probably find that you won't get the parts. The DPFs are very expensive. All the parts on a diesel engine are a lot more robust from the engine side of things or the mechanical side of things, and they're a lot more expensive on the fuel injection side of things. You have a low pressure pump, and then you have a high pressure pump, and then you have electronic injectors with a common rail, plus all the sensors and a turbo which goes with it, and the DPF for treating the exhaust gases afterwards. That's very very expensive if you have contaminated fuel you could be looking at a few thousand pounds worth of uh, repairs if you have a block dpf it's going to cost you 700 to, to 1800 pounds just to replace that unit yeah they do have their faults okay earlier diesels are a, a lot better but they're a lot sootier and they don't have much power in it they are to be honest with you um less efficient okay so now i want to talk about the gasoline engine and this is not my first choice but it's my choice at the moment yeah diesel engine uh, diesel engines are, are very economical when it comes to using fuel petrol engines when you load them up the more weight you have on the more fuel you use okay the faster you go the more fuel you use so it's not economical in that sense okay however it's versatile Compared to what our friend uh, Nate has said, um, gasoline engines lend themselves to different type of fuel systems which uh, the fuel can be made, okay? So I'll list a few of these, okay? Now gasoline is a highly volatile fuel, okay? Paraffin um, is explosive when it gets warm, so that can be used in a petrol engine, okay? Um, gas can be used, Ethanol can be used and methanol can be used. So you've got five different fuel systems, haven't you? You've got five different fuels that you can use. Now, talking about paraffin, yeah. My father, who was in the Royal Air Force just near the end of the World War, he was working for Bomber Command as a technician, not as an aeroplane technician, but as a, uh, as a mechanic, okay? So he was ground crew. He used to have to get up early in the mornings and start the tractors, the tow trucks, on petrol, first of all. And uh, this would be hand cranking, yeah. So you can actually hand crank uh, a petrol engine as compared to a diesel engine, which you can't, okay. And I'll talk about this later, yeah. Um, and then he would turn them over onto paraffin afterwards once the engine was warm. And now this is the key to it. Military vehicles are the same things, the old tuna quarter... Uh, liter Land Rover engine was uh, has a marker timing marker so you can run it on paraffin so basically what you do is you get the engine warm you then switch over onto paraffin and you reset the timing that way it is, is, is going to run okay so there's a possibility there you cannot use paraffin in a diesel engine it's impossible what will happen because it burns hot it will burn the valves out it'll burn the exhaust valves out on the on the cylinder head therefore you have engine damage okay so it's, it's not done now there was uh, an article in a Land Rover magazine that I wrote uh, read years and years ago which was talking about how the military would turn up into an area they would get all different fuels after fuel which is paraffin kerosene um, petrols and diesel engines and uh, fuel and they would mix the fuel with a special test kit so it was all unified unified fuel so the Land Rovers could run on it the trucks could run on it and this is what they would do yeah so um, it's a possibility to be able to mix fuels to get a diesel engine to run on some sort of mixture yes I know the old boys used to mix a litre of uh, paraffin in with a fuel tank in a truck to thin it down enough in the winter to be able to run that vehicle because diesel has a problem when it gets cold doesn't it it waxes just the same as when you put veg oil in a fridge and you let it cool down it starts to get thicker the viscosity gets thicker until it can't move at all so some vehicles when they go into uh, really cold uh, situations they will use heating systems on the fuel lines and in the tanks um, to make sure that that fuel is warm enough so it can get to be injected. Obviously, when a diesel engine is running, it sends hot fuel back to the tank, which is cooled before it gets there, but it's warm enough to, to warm it up. Yeah, so I don't know about Canada. 
and uh, North America and places where it gets really cold. I, I don't know the systems because I, I don't operate there, but I, I'm aware of uh, from my training as a technician that there are add-ons to vehicles which will get the fuel to be warmed up. Yeah, fuel warmers, okay? Yeah, so um, the petrol engine, getting back to my father, he told me about this. He then went to work on uh, balloons, barrage balloons, where he was running machines to fill up barrage balloons with hydrogen fuel, or uh, hydrogen gas, okay, so they could float up into the air and disrupt the German bombers, yeah. And, uh, yeah, this was done by Caustic Soda. Yeah, and I'm sure some of you know that you can produce Brown's gas with caustic soda, and some people do this. They have a little mixture tank into the inlet manifold on their engine just to get that little bit of extra, that little bit of extra um, flammable gas with their air intake here. But I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think that works in uh, small um, doses. Yeah. So I'm sitting there watching a film with him one day. This is an old World War II film. This is about the mosquitoes that had to fly into Norway um, to take out heavy water. Um, factory that the germans were building it's a true story yeah now in one of the scenes there was a car with a contraption on the back of it which was bubbling away and i said to my dad i said dad whatever is that and he said oh yeah that's that's a gas converter that's a gas converter i said what do you mean he says oh yeah that's what we used to use on the uh, with the balloons what hydrogen gas yeah hydrogen gas run with a petrol engine and this was something that they used to do in the war because they were very short of gasoline they would use caustic soda in a machine to be able to take the gas off to run a gasoline engine. Yeah, so there's a fuel source for you. It's just something to think about. Nowadays we use LPG, don't we? Low pressure gas that's on a system that uh, we can switch off the fuel injectors, the petrol injectors, and inject gas, and we get a mileage. Gas in itself is not uh, very calorific. In fact, it's not very efficient and you have to use more gas per mile than you would do with gasoline or even diesel. OK, but it's an alternative fuel. You can use that. Now, in this country, they also mix ethanol in with the petrol. It's possible to run a vehicle on methanol because they do it in South America. They ferment sugar canes, don't they? They take the gas off. They, oh, they, sorry, they they take the chemicals out of the, the sugar and they make uh, methanol with it. They make ethanol in this country. Uh, the sugar factory that I live uh, close to, they have a plant there for making ethanol. It's not actually very efficient to do, but they do it. A vehicle can run on it. It's a spirit. It's got octane. You can, you can explode it with a spark. That's what you need. And it all comes down to engine timing at the end of the day to get that right. However, it, everything has its uh, drawbacks. Gas burns dry. Therefore, you need to know that you have an engine that can actually run on it. Unleaded fuel, same thing. It doesn't have lubricants in the fuel, does it? So the engines have been designed that way to be able to get over that problem. Older carburetor engines that used to run on leaded fuel, very hard to run on gas without any problems, okay? The Rover V8 is a, a typical thing. It's, I've seen the, the damage that can be caused uh, by having dry gas burning through it. But... It's a possibility. It's a possibility. There is more uh, flexibility with a gasoline engine than there is with a diesel engine. Okay. Now, I want to talk about robustness here because this is all very much part and parcel of um, these engines. Okay. Now, um, the diesel engine, because of the compression ratio it has to deal with to compress air into a very small space to make the fuel explode you need everything that's a lot stronger so the engines are a lot heavier okay the starter motors are a lot heavier and the batteries are more heavy duty you need more power to crank that engine over i don't think there's anybody on the planet can actually crank over a diesel engine by hand but i could be wrong some smaller diesel engines have decompression levers that you can wind over before you flip the decompression lever and then they'll start up there's a little pet of uh, single stroke diesel engines that, that we used to have for, on tipper trailers yeah some of you remember this yeah that's an exception to the rule but generally the diesel engine has too much compression to be able to wind it over by hand and as i say it's more robust robust the, the parts are more expensive okay now let's go to the petrol engine, which is lighter in construction. The compression ratio is a lot less. Less, It's probably half 
it doesn't need to compress uh, air into a very tight space because it uses spark to explode the fuel yeah therefore the starter motors are um, smaller and the batteries can be smaller as well that's a bonus straight away because it comes down to cost at the end of the day and it's less duty on uh, the electrical system than what it would be on a diesel engine okay so you're winning you're winning in that way all the parts of the fuel system are a lot cheaper than a diesel engine um, when you have a gasoline engine in this specific car which is fuel injection it has a low pressure pump in the tank and then it has a common rail and fuel injectors there's no high pressure pump there's not a requirement to have a high pressure pump because petrol is injected into the manifold at a low pressure and yes i know you can get high compression injection uh, petrol engines but we are talking about the run of the mill rather than the exception okay so there are less components in the system and they are a lot cheaper because they don't have to deal with high pressures the exhaust systems catalytic converters are not as bad yes you do have lambda sensors and you do have certain uh, ad blue that you that they add to the exhaust but compared to the diesel system which are very complex and they're getting more complex the larger the engine the more after treatment they have to deal with with exhausts well, the petrol engine has less components to it in that side of things so it makes it easier turbos are a luxury yes of course you you get the the power out of it you get the push with it but they are there for a reason variable um vane turbos are there for air control management uh, to be able to get the right burn at the right time okay now if they go wrong then the uh, ecu the fuel system on a common rail uh, diesel system will spit its dummy out of a pram it will give you up ecu uh, mill lights on your dashboard and it will give you reduced power petrol engines don't really have that issue you don't find many non-performance economic cars that have turbos do you this is just for the speed merchants and this is what it's about generally at the end of the day a petrol engine is more about speed than it is about pulling weight now with this vehicle i've chosen a specifically a small petrol engine because i'm not carrying weight on here if i had to um do something where i needed a lorry for instance then i don't have an alternative do i unless i was in a, uh, an eastern european country like the ukraine now this is where i learned the most from these guys because the ex-soviet bloc they had a lot of ex uh, military vehicles they were all large petrol engines um, the buses run on petrol they don't now obviously because they've introduced newer uh, vehicles in the bogdan with the uh, isuzu engine but the older sharabangs uh, this is russia and the ukraine um, they all had petrol engines a because that's what was mostly plentiful there but b also the weather conditions there um, go sub-zero uh, for a portion of the year not siberia but even the ukraine it freezes to up to minus 30 and obviously diesel engines have problems at that temperature with the fuel waxing so these guys are pootling about uh, while you're uh, looking on the side of the road and you have Ivecos and uh, Scania and MAN and uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz all broken down on the side of the road because the, the fuel isn't moving through the fuel lines, these petrol engine vehicles are moving quite well. But what the Ukrainians did after the collapse, fuel got very expensive, so they uh, converted mm, most of the mun municipal vehicles into gas power. Yeah, The Polish have started to do it with the buses now, uh, but the Ukrainians have been doing it for years. So you can see on some of the, the larger vehicles, they have gas tanks either at the back of the cab or they have them underneath the chassis. They are stuck everywhere. And basically, the fuel is a lot cheaper. It's not as efficient, but it's easier accessible. Gas doesn't take um, too much processing to be able to get it out of the ground, get it into a, a tanker trailer and then park the tanker trailer in a garage forecourt for them to fill up the cars and the trucks and the buses and everything else. Now, uh, my neighbour, he owns three different vehicles. One of those is a Volga and that has a four cylinder petrol engine and he has a, an evaporator for the gas, has a tank in the back and he has a switch to switch it over when he wants to turn his uh, fuel um, system off and then bring it on to gas and this is the way that that he goes he's a professional driver he's a professional mechanic and it is the only fuel source that he says it's actually viable they all